SpaceX's Starship is ready for its next integrated orbital flight, and the FAA has completed its safety review required for launch license. Chinese company iSpace makes a big step towards operating its own version of Falcon 9. Three Taikonauts return to Earth after more than 150 days in space. Starlink continues expansion of shells 6 and 7. The ISS wraps up another spacewalk. Artemis 2's SLS begins stacking at Kennedy. A new binary asteroid system is discovered and much, much more. Welcome back to Space This Week. Let's kick things off. The week began with Ship 25 de-stacked from Booster 9 and held in the chopsticks at ground level. But all that changed on Wednesday as the ship was restacked on the booster for not so clear reasons, likely just for further fit testing ahead of the reinstallation of Booster 9's hot staging ring. Following this latest stack, SpaceX then made a bold announcement on Twitter. X, stating that the second flight test of a fully integrated Starship could launch as soon as mid-November, pending regulatory approval of course. This statement being accompanied by some beautiful drone footage of the most recent full stack of Ship 25 and Booster 9. But of course, this post has that ever ominous qualifier that regulatory approval is currently what's stopping the launch right now. But the good news is that we have something of an update regarding this. The FAA announced that they've now completed the safety review portion of the SpaceX Starship Super Heavy launch license evaluation on Tuesday. So all in all, great news. However, there is another component that hasn't met the approval point yet, and that's the US Fish and Wildlife Service, who are continuing with their environmental review and assessment, and we won't be seeing any more launches from Boca Chica until this review is done. When exactly it'll be done is anyone's guess, sadly, but there are some clues that perhaps it'll be sooner rather than later. Firstly, there's the aforementioned statement from SpaceX about targeting mid-November. The vehicle was stacked at the pad and ready to go, obviously, and there is some speculation that an internal launch window has been shared with at least some select people, letting them know to set up their cameras for the launch, though this is totally unconfirmed, of course. Further to this, SpaceX's website was updated last week, so now the first thing you see is a page for Starship's second flight test. The page details the most notable upgrades to the vehicle following the flight and destruction of Ship 24 and Booster 7, noting that during the ascent, the vehicle suffered from propellant leaks in the aft section of Booster 7, which resulted in fires and ultimately severance of connection to the rocket's primary flight computer causing communications lost to the majority of the Raptor engines and control of the vehicle. SpaceX went on to state that they've now implemented leak mitigations and improved testing on engine and booster hardware, as well as significant expansion of Super Heavy's fire suppression system to mitigate against potential future engine bay fires. Also covered in the web page is the fact that the flight termination system fired on command, but the vehicle took nearly a minute to actually break apart, and so SpaceX has now enhanced and requalified the flight termination system so that it behaves a bit more reliably. Speaking of the flight termination system, its installation is the best metric of when to expect a launch. Well, short of an official announcement from SpaceX, of course. There are a lot of workers working around the full stack, not to mention the fact it's mere meters from a public highway, so the flight termination system isn't installed and armed until the last moment, for obvious reasons. So if we see it get installed and armed, it means things are getting serious. Thursday saw another de-stacking of Ship 25 from Booster 9, leaving the ships as they were at the start of the week. Love this shot here from Sean Doherty of NASA Spaceflight, with those big waves rolling in. At the end of the week, a new mesh netting was raised underneath the orbital launch mount. This is likely here to catch anything that falls off the platform during works to the aft section of the booster and the launch mount itself, in order to protect anyone working below the net, and of course protect the water deluge plate itself. So yes, very exciting stuff with the launch date of Flight 2, looking very close on the horizon, hopefully. <laughs> How far do you think it'll get? Will it get further than the 39 kilometers reached by Booster 7 and Ship 24? And if it does, will we see successful stage separation? Let me know your predictions in the comments below. Me personally, I'm very hopeful that the vehicle will reach stage separation, though I wouldn't be at all surprised if we see one or more Raptor outages on Booster 9. My big hope is that we'll see the hot staging take place, and of course see the ship successfully clear the booster. 
I'd say that if we did get as far as ship re-entry, the ship is definitely not going to survive the heat. Let me know what your thoughts are down below, and i got to shamelessly ask you to give it a little thumbs up on the video if you are enjoying it so far. Helps support what I do here and all that. Anyway, while we wait for Starship to take over the Starlink launches, we still have Falcon 9 supporting SpaceX's satellite internet constellation. We saw another two launches over the past week. The first took place on Monday, with the Falcon 9 lifting off from Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 40, carrying 23 Starlink V2 Minis to Starlink Shell 6. The first stage made a successful landing on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions in the Atlantic Ocean, wrapping up its eighth overall mission. The other Starlink launch last week was on Saturday, with the Falcon launching from the very same launch pad as the last one, Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, again carrying 23 Starlink V2 Minis to Shell 7 this time. This particular first stage booster has had a few more flights than the other Falcon 9 booster to fly last week, with a successful touchdown on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship shortly after stage separation, this booster has now flown a whopping 18 times. We are so close to seeing a booster with 20 flights under its belt, I can't wait to see it. In Artemis news now, check out this time lapse shared by NASA. It shows teams at the Kennedy Space Center working to process the solid rocket booster segment inside the rotation, processing, and surge facility. Here you can see the right and left aft motor segments being lifted and mated onto the aft section skirt, which will shortly be followed by the installation of the aft exit cones. Once processing here is completed, the booster segments will be transferred to the vehicle assembly building for final assembly atop the SLS mobile launcher platform. It's getting real. Asteroid 152830 Dinkinesh is the smallest main belt asteroid explored by a spacecraft yet, and since its discovery in 1999, we assumed it was just the one asteroid. But a flyby of NASA's Lucy spacecraft on Wednesday last week revealed that it's actually a binary asteroid system, with Dinkinesh having a natural satellite 220 meters in diameter. So, there you go. <laughs> I have a lot of space station updates to cover this week, for both China's and the International Space Station. Starting with the ISS, NASA astronauts Jasmine Mogbilly and Laurel O'Hara completed US EVA 89 on Wednesday, which was an all-female spacewalk and the station's 269th spacewalk to support its assembly and maintenance in total. The duo's outing involved removing and replacing a trundle-bearing assembly, which allows the station's solar arrays to rotate to maintain alignment with the sun. Following a mission duration of 153 days, 22 hours and 41 minutes, the crew of the Chinese Shenzhou-16 returned to Earth, completing the 11th crewed and 16th flight overall of China's Shenzhou program. The crew undocked from the Tianhe core module of the China space station on Monday last week before re-entering the atmosphere and making a parachute-assisted landing at the Dongfeng landing site in the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region. All three crew members made a safe exit from the capsule during egress operations. The stories from China don't stop there though. Last week, the world got one step closer to having something to finally rival SpaceX's Falcon 9. And no, it's not from Blue Origin. <laughs> but iSpace! Last week, their Hyperbola 2 launch vehicle performed a successful vertical takeoff and then successful vertical landing under its own power, in a hop test similar to the early Starship prototypes and, of course, to SpaceX's Grasshopper test vehicle for its Falcon 9. What's cool here is that the vehicle appeared to make a controlled hover before ultimately touching down, which is something the Falcon 9 isn't capable of, though Starship will be able to do this. When operational, Hyperbola 2 will be a small, partially reusable, two-stage methalox fueled rocket, able to launch up to 1.9 tons to low Earth orbit. So, smaller payload than Falcon 9, but the big question is, what will orbit first? Hyperbola 2 or New Glenn? Hash it out in the comments down below, though iSpace have at least sent stuff to orbit before. We saw two satellite launches from China last week. The first was on Wednesday and was a Long March 6A, carrying the Tianhui 5 satellite from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center, which is located in Shaanxi Province, northern China. Official Chinese sources confirmed that the satellite had entered its desired orbit and will be used for geographic mapping, land resource survey, scientific experiments, and other missions. <laughs> the other Chinese satellite launch last week was a Long March 7A, carrying the TJSW-10 satellite from the Wenchang spacecraft launch site in Hainan Province on Friday. 
The satellite's name is an initialism that stands for Communication Technology Test Satellite 10, and as that name would suggest, it's a technology demonstration platform, with official sources stating that it'll be used for multiband and high-speed communication technology experiments. We had another flight from Virgin Galactic last week. This was their Galactic 05 mission, named so because it was VSS Unity's fifth commercial space flight. Lifting off from Spaceport America on Thursday, the space plane carried three passengers, Dr. Alan Stern, Kelly Garadi, Ketty Bucci Sisti Mazon Rouge, as well as Virgin Galactic crew member Colin Bennett and the two pilots. The spacecraft reached an apogee of 54.2 miles, or 87 kilometers, before making its descent and successful touchdown back at the spaceport. Laon Aerospace had another busy week last week. We visited the surface of Duna in the latest version of Kerbal Space Program 2, which has received a bit of a beautification to its atmospheric visuals following the recent hiring of Blackrack, legendary KSP-1 modder and the guy behind the mod's scatterer and environmental visual enhancements redux, and he's worked his magic on KSP-2 in a big way. If that video sounds interesting to you, then it may well be one of the suggestions on screen. Alongside the names of all my Patreon and channel member supporters, your continued support of this content is what keeps me doing what I'm doing, so big thank you to all of you. And of course, big thank you to you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. The next KSP2 video is going to be a SpaceX homage, so look forward to that one, and I'll see you in the next one.